I want to greet you in the exalted name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to greet every person that is in Bible study tonight and every other person who will watch this uh, Bible study amen, sometime later on. Amen. I salute everybody in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. As Peter put it, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Tonight we will continue the study that we started last week in relation to the presence of God. Amen. But we will examine it through the life of a woman that the Bible calls a sinner. Amen. And since we are in Bible study, it's important that we go to what the scripture has to say in relation to this woman. So if you have your Bibles, I would ask you to look at Luke chapter 7 from verse 36 to verse 50. And we will read it together before we uh, unpack the whole subject of worship or the whole subject of the presence of God tonight. Um, let us look at this particular scripture. Luke chapter 7 from verse 36 to verse 50. And it says, And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with her tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisees which had been him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor, which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged, praise God. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house, thou gavest me no water for my feet. But she has washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Praise God. Thou gavest With the, with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loveth much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is he that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. Praise God. Now, before we get into the study, let me remind us of some of the things we spoke about in the session last week. Amen. So last week, we spoke about the, the presence of God and how it's portrayed in Scripture. So, when we talk about the presence of God, we talk about, firstly, the omnipresence of God. And we say that means that God is everywhere at the same time. 
And we also spoke about the manifested presence of God. And this is where God is making us aware that he is there. So we, 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 we spoke about that last week and we did define in scripture that the Bible speaks of two things. The presence of God in the sense of him being omnipresent and the manifested presence of God. Then we move to the cost of sin. So we said, we looked at the whole subject of uh, what sin has done in relation to us getting into the manifested presence of God. And we look at Isaiah chapter 59 and verse 2, which says, But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. And we were careful to realize that the scripture uses the term iniquity, and it uses the term sin. And we said there's a difference between the term iniquity and sin. So sin comes from a Hebrew word, which actually means to miss the mark. Amen. It refers to doing something against God or against a person. Amen. So the Bible talks about sin, but the Bible also talks about iniquity. And iniquity is more a more deeply rooted word. And it means premeditated choice. It means to commit... Uh, to continue to do sin without any form of repentance. Amen. So the scripture says, but your iniquity has separated you from your God and from your sins God has hid his faith from you and therefore he will not hear. Then we look at the whole thing out. Who then can stand? Amen. Because the truth be told, none of us are righteous in the eyes of God. Amen. So we looked at the scripture in Psalms 130 verse 1 to 3. Especially verse 3 says, But if thou, Lord, should mark iniquity, who shall stand? Amen. But there is a forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. So we see from the scripture that truthfully, none of us um, are in a rightful place to say that we can stand before the presence of God because all have sinned according to the Psalms and have come short of the glory of God. So who really can stand amen we want to get into the manifested presence of god amen we realize that because of sin it has caused a separation between man and god and therefore if that's the case who really can stand david put it this way amen we were born in sin and shapen in iniquity we were molded by the whole iniquity which is a presumptuous sin amen so none of us can sin. And we even go as far to say uh, the efforts of men in trying to get themselves out of this dilemma that we find ourselves in. And we look at the scripture in the book of Genesis chapter 3 and verse 7. And it says, then the eyes of both were open and they knew that they were naked. And the Bible said, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves covering. So we see the effort of men trying to cover themselves amen being in a state of guilt being in a state of sin amen they try to make a whole effort to cover themselves being in a state of nakedness and we realize that the effort of men amen is it can't get it anywhere we looked at um comparative religions amen in a in a brief sense and we looked at couple religions out there that are trying to do good things amen we talk about for example amen uh islam amen which you have to follow the five pillars of islam to be saved we look at hinduism and buddhism which has parts and ways that you have to do amen and these all show men trying to reach to god but all our efforts are in vain because all have sinned and come in short of the glory of god but thanks be to god we also look at the fact that jesus had provided a way for us to get to him and to get into his presence amen so the scripture declare for example in saint john chapter 3 verse 14 to 15 that and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And we did say that this is, scripture is showing a fulfillment of a type 
that is found in the book of Numbers, amen, where the children of Israel committed sin and God raised up fiery serpent to bite them, amen. And it so happened, praise God, that God, uh, they, that they, they cried to, to, to Moses and Moses cried to God and said, boy, um, provide some way for them. And God said, okay, I'm going to do something. Build a bronze serpent, amen, and put it on a pole and lift it up. And anybody who is bitten by the snake, Amen. When they look, amen, to that bronze instrument, amen, they shall be saved. So in a similar way, what that was, was a, a, a type of Jesus Christ now being on the cross, amen. And when we look to Jesus and his death on the cross, amen, we can be saved from the sin or the sting of death. Praise God. So we are happy that Jesus had provided a way for us to come into the presence of Almighty God. Praise God. Then we moved further and we went back and we saw where God has created a pattern for us to enter into his presence. And, and what I'm doing is just recapping, uh, praise God, what we did last week before we jump into the whole story about this woman. Amen. So we see uh, in the Old Testament, amen, where God created a pattern for us to enter into the presence of God. Amen. And he, he laid out um, some furniture in, 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 the, uh, in the tabernacle, amen, in the wilderness for people to move from uh, the entrance of the tabernacle and to get into what is called the Holy of Holies, into where the presence of God would have dwelt. Amen. And it so happened that this pattern, in my opinion, this pattern is what God has laid out and it followed. Amen. We can get into the presence of Almighty God. So we looked at the brazen altar, for example, and we say at the brazen altar, it deals with our sin. Amen. And it deals with our guilt issue. Praise God. And, and while I'm here, I must let you know that, you know, a lot of us, when we come to a state of repentance, amen, we, we, we acknowledge that God can deal with our sin. But a lot of us um, remain guilty in our minds, praise God, because we feel that, look here, we are not, we, we feel that, boy, God has not really forgiven us. We feel unworthy, amen. And, and, and that's, that's how the devil operates. He wants to, he wants to, us down as it were eh, praise God in guilt amen guilt and and shame brethren is a very powerful emotion because it caused people to feel dejected it caused people to feel unaccepted it it, it, it makes you feel damaged uh, with beyond repair and that's what guilt and shame does and the devil capitalizes on this for well, once he knows amen that you're in a state of guilt amen even though the blood of Jesus has dealt with that issue it's the devil's duty to ensure that he keeps you in that place because once you are crippled by guilt once you're crippled by shame amen it doesn't allow you to operate in how God would want you to operate. But I'm here to encourage somebody who is now at the brazen altar, at that place of repentance, that there the Bible has given you a weapon. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4 to 5, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of what strongholds casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Can I tell you something? An imagination is an image in your mind that is not correct. Praise God. And if the devil can get you to see yourself as a failure. If the devil can get you to see yourself as an outcast. If the devil can get you to believe that you are not actually washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Then he has somehow won part of the battle. But I'm here to encourage you that at the brazen altar, God does not only deal with your sin issue. But if you allow him, he also deals with your guilt issue. And every imagination every shame every guilt is dealt with at the brazen altar then we moved from the brazen altar to the brazen laver and note these two things are in what is called the the outer court amen that's the that's the courtyard amen of, of the tabernacle so the brazen altar is where we are now washed by the word so at the brazen 
altar we are washed by the blood, but at the brazen labor, sorry, we are washed by the word of God. So apart from the fact that God deals with our sin and our guilt at the brazen altar, he moves us now to where the word is and you know washes us through the word of Jesus Christ. Then he moves us into the holy place where we go to the table of shoe bread, where our will is being submitted to God. Amen. So you submit your will to the Almighty God. Amen. I would move to the, the golden candle and um, candlestick where we win the battle in our minds because at this point in time praise god we realize that we are now being illuminated in our minds through the golden the anointing presence of god then we move to the golden altar of incense and this is where the beautiful fragrance of prayer and praise propels us to get to that another level which is worship can i tell somebody something and i did say last week that is exactly golden altar of incense that we are closest to the shekinah presence of god in other words is that that place of prayer a prayerful man is a man that is close to god amen then we moved to the holy of holies and this is where we experience the presence of the raw presence of god amen and this is where we worship in spirit and we sense his holiness amen and your problems that you had amen all the issues that uh, that has been confronting you all the the, the the troubles that you have been going through praise god seems to be small in comparison to the father's power because now we are now in the raw light of god and now we are now in the the, the, the real shekinah presence of god we said it last week that in the outer court the light is from the natural light of the sun amen so the priest's garment looks white in the holy place the light is from the golden candlestick in which you are illuminated but in the holy of holies the light comes from the shekinah presence of almighty god and this is where we want to go amen and then we just just to show you a picture of what we spoke about last week praise god this is how it looks we did say that the the, the tabernacle faced the east and there's a reason for that because the sun rises in the east so when you're going into the tabernacle your back should be turned to the east amen and in the outer court and the courtyard, I just saw that first furniture there is the brazen altar. That round thing is the brazen lever. And this is where we, we enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Amen. And then we move into the holy place, into his court with praise. And there's a third level, which is the holy of holies, where we get really into the presence of Almighty God. And then, while I did not say this, but we can link all of these three layers to the, to the fact that man is what is called a tripartite being. Amen. We have a body, we have a soul, and we have a spirit. Amen. So, the, so, so Paul make mention of this um, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23. He says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and your body, or better, your spirit, and your soul and your body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So we are fully aware, amen, that um, as it come on to God, God is concerned with the whole man. Amen. But with the body, we can touch, we can taste, we can smell, we can see, we can hear. And it makes us world conscious. With the soul, we have intelligence and we have willpower and we have emotions and it makes us self-conscious. But when we worship the Lord and we get into his true presence, this is, takes place in the spirit and it starts to worship and to reverence. And this is where we become God conscious. So just like the tabernacle had three sections to it, man has, is a tripartite being. And it's in your spirit that you give the reverence and the worship to Almighty God. Praise God. Now, that's just a quick recap of where we went last week. Now we're going to look at Luke chapter 7. And we're going to do a background in relation to that particular scripture. We're going to try to, 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 to go as deep as we can. Amen. We're going to try to even look at, uh, look at it from, um, from its historical perspective in some, in some regard. We're going to try to look at it from a grammatical um, preference in some regard. But we're going to try to pull out from the scripture. What can we learn from this? 
as it relates to the presence of God. What can we learn from this woman, amen, and her interaction with Jesus Christ as it relates to the presence of God? So let us just jump into Luke chapter 7. And we see, for example, that it records the occasion where Jesus was invited to the house of a Pharisee named Simon. And, you know, it's interesting because you would have gotten the impression Jesus was a person who, what, most times when we look at scripture, he had some uh, form of quarrel i'll put that term i'll probably find a better one between himself and the pharisees the pharisees uh phone uh thought it was better for them to follow the 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 the, 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 the oral laws and the written laws and in some cases um they even emphasize amen the minor things over the the the, the major things amen jesus at all times um would 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 be contentious as it were between himself and the and the and the Pharisees. So it, 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 there's a point. There's, it, there's even a point where Jesus says in Matthew chapter twenty three and verse twenty four, "You blind guides, which train at a gnat and swallow a camel." Amen. And Jesus was talking to the Pharisees, and in the context of that particular scripture, what he was saying to them, because it's it, it's really is impossible. For somebody to swallow a camel. Amen. But what he was saying, they were emphasizing the minor things, amen, and neglecting the more weightier things of the law. And he was saying to the Pharisees, practically, you are blind people, amen. While you're telling people not to strain out the blood out of the gnat, at the same time you are swallowing a camel. He used euphemism, amen, as it were, to tell them that look, you need to emphasize, praise God, the major things are major in the major, are not minor, are not major in the minor. Amen. So we, we, we see many cases where Jesus had contention between himself and the Pharisees. But the scripture clearly said that a Pharisee invited Jesus to his house. And that spoke volume um, to the fact that, um, um, that Jesus was respected, even though they might not have agreed amen, with how he did everything. Amen. There were many cases where, where, they, where, they, where they tried to say he broke the law, so on and so forth. Amen. They could not deny that this man was a man of God. And, and I like the fact that even though um, Jesus was, uh, didn't, have, didn't see eye to eye, amen, at with these Pharisees, the fact that they invited him to his house, he was willing to go. What am I saying is that God is not a respecter of person. Amen. And as long as you invite God to your house, amen, he would come. Amen. It doesn't matter if you are the worst of sinner. It doesn't matter if you are the right, most righteous man on the earth. If you invite him to your house, amen, we see where Jesus took the time out to go to the Pharisee, or Simon who was the Pharisee, go to his house amen the second thing i want to make note of too is that a lot of us have read the scripture in matthew chapter 26 from verse 6 to 13 mark chapter 14 verse 3 to 9 and saint john chapter 12 verse 2 to 8 and you, you would get the impression amen that this incident is talking about the same incident in luke chapter 7 amen but I beg to differ that the incident in Luke chapter 7 is different than the incident in Matthew chapter 26, Mark chapter 14, and St. John chapter 12. And we're going to examine some few reasons. Since we're in Bible study, amen, let us try to, to, to get, try to exegete or pull out um, correct things out of what the scripture is saying and correct understanding of where the scripture is going so let's just examine a few reasons why i say praise god that the two incidents are different first reason in luke chapter 7 the location of the event took place at galilee now galilee brethren is northern palestine galilee is to the north galilee is near to where jesus came from amen galilee is is where the poor uh, the, the poor set of people lived. So Jesus came from Nazareth, and Nazareth is near to Galilee, which is to the north. Amen. So the incident where this woman anointed Jesus' feet in Luke chapter 7 took place at Galilee. The other incident where a woman anointed Jesus' feet took place at Bethany. Now, Bethany, brethren, is to the south. Bethany is below uh, um, Samaria. Bethany is near to Jerusalem. 
Amen. It's a different location. So the location alone tells you that the two events cannot be the same. Secondly, the treatment of the woman. Amen. In Luke chapter 7, the scripture we just read a while ago, when the woman came in and she began to anoint the feet of Jesus, amen, we realize, brethren, that she was being despised. It was obviously that they, 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 they were very uncomfortable with the fact that this woman came into the house, praise God, and, 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 and was doing anointing the feet of Jesus or anointing Jesus. They were very uncomfortable, amen. But in the case of the woman in Matthew chapter 26 and Mark chapter 14 and St. John chapter 12, there is no record that they, she was despised. What was said there was that they were more uh, curious about why she was um, taking all of this expensive ointment and pouring on Jesus' feet when it could be given to the poor. And it was, it was um, Judas who made that, 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 that statement so why would he take this ointment and, and give to the poor and so on and so forth the bible even wants to say that he was a thief and, and loved the money bag all right so the treatment of the woman was different so we see the location being different the treatment being different the anointing was also different so in luke chapter 7 the scripture clearly says that she anointed his feet in matthew chapter 26 mark chapter 14 and john chapter 12 the Bible said he, she anointed his head. In Luke chapter 7, there was a criticism about the woman, the moral of the woman. The Bible clearly said that this woman was a sinner. She was not even named. This woman was a sinner. All right? Um, and and, and the, the criticism in, 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 in Mark, Matthew chapter 26 was about the value of the perfume. So in one case, the criticism was on the woman. In another instance, the criticism was the value of the perfume. So the, I just wanted to bring this out so we don't get confused when we read the events in Matthew chapter 26, Mark chapter 14, and St. John chapter 12. And there are other things that I can speak of. So for example, in Luke chapter 7, the event took place at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. In Luke chapter, in Mark chapter 26 and the other verses, it took place at the end of his ministry. So again, we see a big disparity between what was taking place in Luke chapter 7 and Matthew chapter 6. But I must tell you, brethren, that this has been an ongoing debate. And you have people who have other reasons why they think that they are one and the same. But it is my opinion, based on how I look at the scripture, based on what, they, the, what is taking place in the scripture, that I would say that these are two separate events. Very important. Now, they, they, what makes it uh, a little bit difficult for people, amen, are a little bit confusing are because of the very similarities that took place. So there are a couple of similarities. However, so for example, Jesus was anointed with an expensive perfume in both events. Amen. Um, second, Jesus was anointed by a woman. Matthew, in Luke chapter 7, the woman is not named. In Matthew chapter 26, she is named Mary. Mary of Bethany. All right. Another similarity is that this event took place in a man's name, man's house by the name of Simon. So in both instances, it was Simon. But Luke chapter 7 says, Simon the Pharisee. And in Matthew chapter 26 and Mark chapter 14 and St. John chapter 12, it says Simon the leper. So the, it's, it's, it, it's, the name Simon, brethren, is, 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 a, is a very common name back in those days. I have to be very careful because um, it's like the name, even Peter himself was called Simon. Amen. It's just like somebody saying um, Andrew, which is my name, a very common name. Amen. A lot of people name Andrew and, and or Bob. A, a lot of people call you Bob or something like that. It's a very common name. Now let us move on to, to, to something else that I want to bring to our attention. The background as it relates to um, um, what was taking place here. So in Luke chapter 7, it deals with somebody by the name of Simon the Pharisee. And um, I, I and I want to to examine this a little bit more too, because first of all, we read a lot in Scripture um, about uh, Pharisees, and we see it a lot in the New Testament. But really, who are Pharisees? Um, where did they come from? Amen. And 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 I want us because we are in Bible study. Amen. And I want us to to grow in grace and in knowledge of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ to examine exactly. 
who this Pharisee is and where this term Pharisee came from, amen, as we dig down into Luke chapter 7. So, the Pharisees were the separationists who insist on preserving the traditions. And let me tell you what happened. Um, there's a point in time, if you can remember, in your history between the book of Malachi and the book of Matthew, there is about 400 years they call it the 400 silent years amen and and according to history if you can remember in the book of daniel there was a man by the name of nebuchadnezzar who came and he had world power under the babylonian empire then you had the took over from him was the Medo persians amen so you had darius and 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 art and so on, Artaxerxes and all these other kings who were Persian kings who came and they became world power. Amen. After them, you had what was called the, the Grecians. Amen. And that was under Alexander the Great. And the Grecian Empire, amen, at some point after Alexander the Great died, amen, it was split into four. Amen. These four generals took over from him. And one of the, the, the set of sect that took over from him were the Syrians. And they gave the, the, the Jews the most problems um, during that time when the Grecians um, were in power. And, and they, they, they pushed, as it were, their, their, their culture, their Hellenic. When we talk about Hellenic, you're talking about Greek culture. So they pushed their Greek culture uh, upon the Jews. And that caused a problem, amen, during that time. Amen. You, you, had, you had people who rebelled against this. So, for example, you had a guy by the name of um, Maccabees, amen, and he, he was a, a, a priest during that, a Jewish priest, and he rebelled against the whole um, influence, the, Greek, the, 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 the Grecian influence being injected on the, on, on the Jews during that time, amen. And it was so bad, brethren, that it is believed that they even put a statue of Zeus in their in the temple amen and 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 you had a, a wicked guy a guy by the name of antiochus epiphanes also who desecrated the temple and he offered pig amen but this guy by the name of um maccabees them call him the hammer he decided that he was going to deal with the issue and they fought against the syrians during that time and and they they fought against the whole introduction of the hellenic type of culture amen and they decided that they're not going to, 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 to keep this. As a matter of fact, when Maccabees fought in the temple and they won that war, to this very day, during our Christmas time, amen, the Jews have a celebration they have every year called the, the, the Feast of Lights. And you would think that they're actually celebrating Christmas, but what they're, not, they're not celebrating Christmas because they don't believe in Jesus. What they're celebrating is the... Is the the liberation they got during that time um, from the Syrians who desecrated their temple under Maccabees. All right. So it so happened that during that, that time they, they fought against them. Um, so you had a set of people who were very um, careful in terms of how they looked at the whole um, Hellenic culture being introduced to them. Amen. And they decided that they're going to separate themselves from this. And they decided they're going to keep. Um, the laws of Moses and they decide they're going to keep also the oral laws and they, 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 these things are stored in a thing they call the Talmud which is practically a collection of all the oral laws coming down so apart from the Tenak or which is the Torah um, or the Old Testament as we know it amen amen they also had oral traditions in what is called the Talmud and they decide that they're going to keep this and they're going to hold to these things amen and it so happened that this separate group, amen, they grew stronger and they keep on growing stronger and stronger. And they but the problem was that they became more legalistic and rigid in how they, they, they did their thing until the point where they, 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 they became a target for most of the scorching words, amen, that Jesus spoke. Because now they started to highlight the law to a, to, 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 to a point where it become like as they were their God. All right? But from this separate group amen is what came to be known in the new testament as the pharisees amen that was a group that decided they're going to separate themselves from all the the greek culture and all the greek influence that exists 
On the other hand, brethren, there was another set of people who loved the Greek culture. Amen. But they still wanted, as it were, to hold on to some of the, the laws or to the laws of Moses, especially those that were found in the Torah. All right. But they decided by following the Greek laws, they, 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 they disregarded or they seized their belief in uh, the supernatural. So stuff like angels and, and stuff like the resurrection and things like this. They decided that they're not going to, to, to withhold these things and they held on to some Greek things. Amen. And this set of group became known as the Sadducees. So now you understand why we, when we come into the New Testament time where they were now under Roman um, power. Amen. We see these two set of People always at contention, coming to Jesus, trying to find out what Jesus had to say in relation if the Pharisees are right or if the Sadducees are right. But this is where it came from. Amen. So, in Luke chapter 7, we're dealing with Simon who came from a group of Pharisees, who uh, came from a group that is called the Pharisees, who separated themselves um, to, 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 to keep themselves, as it were, to the laws of Moses and the Talmud. And there are many Pharisees in scriptures, brethren. Paul himself was a, was a Pharisee. Amen. Um, Nicodemus, who came to Jesus by night, was a, was a Pharisee. Um, Zacchaeus, amen, was a Pharisee. So we'll see examples in scriptures where this was a very prominent group. But the purpose of them were to separate, amen, from the thing. So that's one thing I want us to highlight before we even go into this woman. That the Pharisees... Praise God. And the term Pharisees, where it came from. So we don't find that in the Old Testament, but we find it in the New Testament. Another thing I want to bring to our attention is the whole thing about the table. Amen. The table that was there um, during that time. Now, here's where we're going to go. Here's where we're going to go into uh, a little bit more the culture as it relates to uh, what was taking place. Now, I know most of us have seen the drawing of Michelangelo, amen, where he, the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, where Jesus sat at the table and his disciples were with him, amen. But can I tell you, brethren, based on studying um, the culture of that time, you realize that it's a very bad picture of how the table looked during that time. He used his Eastern or his Western idea of people sitting at a table to, to bring across, amen, what he thought the Lord's Supper looked like. So, we need to understand this, what was taking place um, here. So, the people in the first century or the Middle East did not sit in chairs. So, when, 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 when they were at the table, they were not sitting at a chair with their foot on the table and they sat down and they were eating. No, the dinner table was very low to the ground and the guests would lie on a mat and their head near to the table and their feet away from the table. So that their feet would either be behind them or beside them. Amen. So it's that, that's, that will give you a good example now why this woman was able to anoint his feet. It's not that she came down and got under the table to anoint his feet. But his feet was more likely behind him which gave her access amen, to his feet easily. Amen. And what would have happened is that they would have, when they, when they sat like this on this very low table, amen, they would prop themselves um, and they would raise themselves on their left elbow and they would eat with their right hand. So it's a known fact. Amen. As a matter of fact, this, this particular thing is, is more uh, Greco-Roman in terms of the, how they sat at the table. But we, we, we can readily see that this is what was taking place based on a Greek word that is used in that particular scripture, which means to recline. So he was reclining at the table. And that Greek word is uh, kakolino. Um, and so he was reclining at the table, and which means that one elbow would have been on the table and he would be eating with his right hand. And the social custom allowed the needy people to partake and to, and to, in some of the leftovers that took place there. And another thing must understand about that, brethren, is that large crowds would gather, especially when a famous rabbi was in audience. Because another thing that comes to mind, when you talk about going into a person's house, amen, and I want to examine these things because I want us to get the picture of what was taking place in the first century. Normally, when somebody invites me to dinner, amen, we would go to the person's house in, in our culture, and we would go inside, amen, and then we would lock the door and we would go inside. So anybody else, amen, would not have access 
inside the place like that. Amen. But let us, we're going to look at that a little bit. But what would have normally happened at the table is that a large crowd would gather, especially when a famous rabbi was in attendance. Hence the reason why um, there was a lot of people there. Amen. That was taking place at the time. Lord, apart so now we have an idea of the Pharisee and who the Pharisee was. And we have an idea also of how the table looks and why this woman had access to his feet. But there are still some questions that, that need to be asked. And as I look into the scripture and I observe the scripture, I'm realizing that there are some things that, that I would still want answers to if I was to examine the scriptures very clearly. So let's just jump to this woman and see what her about. Luke tells us that there comes a woman unexpected. She was a visitor unexpected at that particular event. And she crashed the party. Because guess what happened? First of all, everybody in the town knows that this woman was a sinner. The Bible it was clear to describe this woman in Luke chapter 7 and verse 37 as a sinner. And, and brethren, there is only two reasons why somebody is called a sinner during that time. One is either she was very promiscuous. In other words, she had a very sexual lifestyle, amen, like the woman that was caught in adultery in, 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 in St. John chapter 8, something like that. She probably had a reputation of probably being a prostitute or something like that. That is one of the reasons why somebody would be described as a sinful woman. Or it could be a case where this woman outwardly um, disregarded, as it were, the, the laws especially the Talmud and the written laws. So the Bible described her as a sinful woman. And I'm saying, here it is that the sinful woman, Jesus is invited to a dinner at Simon the Pharisee's house. And this sinful woman out of the blues come to Simon's house. Amen. And she decides to start anoint Jesus' feet. And she starts to, to wash his, his, his feet with our, with our tears and dry it with our hair. And I'm saying, the big question is, how did this woman get into the house of a Pharisee? And that's one of the questions I've, I, I've asked as I look into the scripture. What would have caused this woman to get into the house? And this is where we need to understand again the culture. Amen. So, um, as, as somebody who loves the whole subject of hermeneutics, and hermeneutics is just the, 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 the science and the art of interpreting scriptures. And when you study scriptures, you have to get into um, what is called, what, what we call the grammatical historical method. Amen. Which is practically getting into the grammar and the history behind what was taking place. I could not sit down and, and just see this woman. My mind was blown. Because I'm saying, if, if Jesus is in a Pharisee's house, if Jesus went in for dinner, even understanding the setup of the table, how did this woman get inside this person's house? And, I'm, and I mean, as I said before, in our culture, somebody invites me to dinner, somebody invites me to dinner, then the main thing I would do, brethren, is that I would ensure, I would ensure that at the end of the day, I, when I come into that person's house, they would have, in our culture, we would have locked the door, we would have close the door to ensure that um, any person who is not invited stays out. Amen. But understanding amen, the culture of the Jews will realize that it's not like that. As a matter of fact, what would have normally happened is that people, the, 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 the setup of the house is a little different. And people would have gathered around the table. As, as I said before, especially when a very famous rabbi comes to, to town, people would have gathered around to be a part of the whole conversation that is taking place. All right? So it was a norm thing. It was an open event. People would sit on the walls. People would, would, would gather around. And those, so the, the, the invitee guests would be around the table. But other people in the community and the area would be gathered around the table, standing and being a part of the conversation. Amen. And that would have that, that given her access, as it were, into the presence of Jesus. Amen. And therefore, it was not out of the way. 
as it were, for this woman to also be a part of the discussion. Seeing everybody gather, she probably come as a part of the crowd, amen, and she gathered there in Simon's house, amen, and she saw an opportunity to get into the presence of God. She saw an opportunity to bless God, amen. I wonder how many times we get an opportunity and we miss it, amen. We are in the house of God. We are where Jesus is. But this woman realized, praise God, that it was this man was not just any normal person. This was somebody who was was who had probably had dealt with her. She probably had met him before this event. And Jesus had spoken to her about her sin issues. She was a sinful woman. And she was grateful. And can I tell you something also? This is not something that had happened only to Jesus Christ himself. If you read the Talmud, it gives you stories of people who, famous rabbis, who, who, who women would normally... In, in showing gratitude to the rabbi, they would anoint his feet. But this woman obviously moved it to another notch. She recognized that this man did not only just deal with the, it was not only um, preaching or teaching good stuff, but he dealt with her inner person. He dealt with who she was and it moved her to a place, now just, not just anointing the feet, but to a place of tears, a place where she used her hair, which is her glory, praise God, to anoint um, the feet of Jesus Christ. Now jumping back to the slides, let us examine the alabaster box. Praise God. The alabaster box. So this woman brought something that was very precious to Jesus Christ. And we have to, and we're going to look at the whole thing of what we need to bring when we come into the presence of God. It says, woman, she brought something that was very valuable to her. Amen. And you see this word alabaster, it comes from uh, this it, it, it was a little box that was built to carry very, very precious, precious ointment. And the name Alabaster comes from the place in Egypt, Alabaston, amen, where it was at, uh, Alabastron, sorry, the place where they actually built this particular box. So they would build it, it would have a very narrow head, it looked like... Um, Marble in color. That's it. That, 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 that the type of color it had, like a whitish, marblish color. And the it, it 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 women would have carried it around their necks. It was it was so precious to them that even a uh, woman would have would have. The, 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 the Pharisees allowed the woman to even carry it on them on the, on the Sabbath day. Amen. It, that was how valuable it was. Amen. And it it, it was like in some cases it was like a dory. It valued a whole, it valued your life settings. And this woman brought an alabaster box full of precious ointment. It showed that it was like you taking out your entire saving, amen, and trying to, and, and carrying it, and giving it, pour it out at Jesus' feet. Now, Mark chapter 14 records the story of how Mary of Bethany anointed Jesus with precious ointment just before the Last Supper. And the Bible is, declares in Mark chapter 14 that the anointment she put on Jesus' word a full year's wage. It shows you the value. It's like, it's like you getting all of your pay one day. So imagine one day you go to work. And whatever you're paid for a year, you're getting all of that in one day. This is how valuable that an ointment was to this woman. Amen. And how valuable it was to people in that time. As a matter of fact, single women found this very um this ointment very important amen because if they should and even the married women too because if you should get married and your husband if you're from a set of pharisees that were called the hillel who believe that if you should do any uncleanness be found in you for example they would have put you out so if you burn the man clothes for example or you, you never did something right they could have put you out and divorced you amen and it so happened that these are the things that would have kept them because in that society the man was the person who was the breadwinner for the house so that when she poured out that oil what she was doing was put, pulling out her her security she was pouring out everything that she held as value um that would have been the most valuable thing to her. That was very, very important. So her sacrifice was very great. Another thing that we saw is how love was expressed by this woman. And we're going, we're going, we're going, we're going, we're going to try to break this down as we go further. So her love was expressed with her tears, praise God. So the act of crying, praise God, revealed how she was overwhelmed with sorrow over her past. 
Amen. She knew that in the society, amen, she was a sinner. She knew that in the society, she was a nobody. Amen. She was an outcast. She was, she was the, the, probably the only thing that was worse than her, amen, was probably a leopard or a Samaritan. Amen. Because the Jews hated the Samaritans and the leopards had to find their place. But being a woman that's a sinner, you were disregarded. And the, the, the volume of her tears made Jesus' feet wet. Um, she, she was she, she was crying she was weeping over the fact that 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 she had lived all his life but for the first in her life amen she met somebody who gave her the power amen to live above she that gave her the power that not that make her feel so condemned by her past but was telling her that even though amen you had falling amen there is something in your heart that says you can go on that's what the bible says the righteous falls seven times and then he gets back up again if the righteous falls seven times it doesn't mean amen it's not because his righteous makes him fall i not even because he's righteous why he gets back up amen but what exactly happened it shows you the heart of the person amen when somebody have a heart towards god irrespective of what comes your way when you get an interaction with him you might fall you might be in a place where you should not be you might be in your wilderness you might be in your deserted place you might feel like an outcast but i'm grateful to god that when this woman came amen she was able to carry something precious to him she was able to weep over his feet amen she broke all the customs all the 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 the, 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 the customs of the time and sometimes it going to take us to go outside of the custom Amen. To get into the presence of Almighty God. It was not customary for a woman to let down her hair like that. Amen. It was out of the place practically. But this woman didn't care. Amen. She saw his foot being wet. Amen. And she used the, the, the thing that was most glorious to her. And she wiped his feet. The hair is given for the woman as her glory and her beauty. Amen. And she used her glory and she used her beauty, Habo, to anoint the feet of Jesus Christ. Her love, praise God, was expressed with our tears. That's when we're talking about getting into the presence of God. It must be, it must be costly. It must be out of a heart of love. Somebody that realized, amen, that I was a sinner. I am a sinner, but I was saved by grace. By grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself, not, not of, not of, works that any man should boast practically when i think about these things i should have been an outcast a dog amen I, sh I, I i i i i'm not even worthy praise god but guess what like this woman we can express our love as we get into the presence of almighty god but i want us to notice something in the scripture also because these things will happen and the enemy will put it there we see a response to how this woman a response to, to this woman's expression to Jesus. The Bible says in Luke chapter 7 verse 39. Now when the Pharisee which had been him saw it. And know the term been him. Because what would have happened in that time. Amen. They would have invited you. And it was normal culture for you to deny it. And then they would have to invite you, like, bid you to come. Like, please come, come. Yes, that, was, that, that was the culture. It's it just a culture that they had. So now the Pharisee, which is talking about Simon, which bid him to come, he spake within himself. In other words, he never talked out loud. He talked within his heart, that saying that this man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what man of woman this is that had touched him, for she is a sinner. And when I think about that, I realize how similar a lot of us are in how we deal with people. We know people's past. We know what they have been through. And probably Rev might ask somebody to preach or ask somebody to do something in the house of God or ask somebody to get involved in something. And instead of us welcoming back a brethren that was dead but is now alive we play the role of the big brother in the prodigal son and like this pharisee we say if bishop didn't know or if bishop was truly serious a lot of us and 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 and, and we have to be so careful brethren 
how we address the things of God. God don't deal with everybody the same way. And therefore, the way God deals with individuals, allow God to deal with and, and God has a place, a leader above us. Amen. And God has given him a heart and knows how to express himself to each and every individual. God knows each and every one of our hearts. And while he might be harsh on somebody else, and God require it, amen, there might be a case where it's extended. It might be a case where God sees the heart because God, Jesus knew the heart of this woman. Jesus knew where she was. Simon knew her past. And like the devil, he uses your past to get to you. Amen. But we must always remember that God deals with sin differently. In some cases, God might express judgment instantly, like in the case of Sodom and Gomorrah. Or God might make you walk in your life path lessons, like the children of Israel going to the wilderness. Or the judgment might be reserved ahead of you, but leave the judgment to God. That's the point I'm trying to make. Amen. Our aim is to pray for people. Our aim is to ensure that even if the brethren fell, amen, that we believe that God is a restorer. Because the truth be told, all have sinned. And there's none of us, we all have our issues we are dealing with. But Simon, who was the Pharisee, all he saw was a woman. He did not see her love for Jesus. He did not see the, 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 the cost of her oil and the cost of what she had to do. She saw the presence of God as a valuable. So Simon doubted that Jesus now could not be a prophet because if he were a prophet, he would have known what manner of woman this is that touched Jesus. Simon the Pharisees doubted that Jesus was a prophet because he thought that Jesus was unable to see the woman's heart. What a wicked. But Jesus showed that he can read the heart of man by exposing Simon's heart. So while Simon was saying that Jesus, in his heart, that Jesus didn't know this woman's heart, Jesus brought out to Simon, who was the critic, that he knows the heart of men. So, Jesus said to Simon, I want to say something to you. Simon, he said, yes, Lord, he said, I want to say something. He said, Master, say on. In other words, all right, talk. What do you want to talk? And Jesus expressed a parable that I find to be very powerful. Because really, it's a picture of all of us. Jesus said there was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. Praise God. And when they had nothing to pay, in other words, you are indebted to a, to a plumb body. You have nothing to pay. He frankly forgave them both. And then Jesus asked the question, tell me therefore, which of them will love him the most? And Simon said, I know the response, I suppose. In other words, all right, I think, because he realized where Jesus was going. I suppose that to whom he forgave the most. And he said unto him, thou hast rightly judged Now, before I jump into this slide, I want to say something. It's, it's, it's unfortunate that sometimes the translators would use the term pence because pence was the currency of their day, right? But sometimes it loses the true essence of what the writer was saying. The right Greek word there comes from a word which actually speaks to a denaro. That's practically what it is. And what a denaro is, was practically a day's, a denarii. It was a day's wage for a Roman soldier. So think about it then. One person, think about you getting 
or what you get paid for in a day. So one person owed a day times 50. So that's about two months. It's called two working months. If you're going to say five, um, five working days in the week. Using our culture. So one person owed two days, two months worth of salary. And another person owed 500 days worth of salary. That's a holy brethren. When you do the comparison between the two, it is evident that the person who owe the 500 days would have seen himself and said, my God, because it's like a big debt. And the debtor says, look here, all right, we realize you can't pay me. So, your debt, I forgive you. But then when we look into our lives and we realize some things that we have done, some of us are 50 pence, you know, or 50 denaro, or denari. But some of us are 500 because we have done some stuff. And then we will look at the fact that God did not strike us down. We look at the fact that we are able to come into the presence of God and say, God, forgive me, and he washes us. My God, it must blow your mind. So Jesus brought out this. And then Jesus go on to, Jesus then turned to the woman, but he spoke to Simon. And he made reference to some common courtesies that, 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 that this woman did that Simon didn't do. Jesus said, Jesus, the woman washed my feet with her tears. And wipe them with her hair of her head. And he said, Simon, for me come, you don't even give me the water for my feet. And you might wonder why he said that. In those days, it is common for when somebody comes to your house. It's like today. If somebody comes to your house, you invite them in. Come on, courtesy. Somebody come to visit you, invite them in. You're not going to leave them up on the car porch or stand up or whatever. You're going to see him a little out of place. Right? Unless you've never really invited them, I don't want them in your house. But if somebody that you invite in, you should show that you're welcome, you invite them in. In a similar way, the courtesies that should be, have been extended to Jesus, Simon didn't extend them. It was common for when somebody to come off the road that a slave would have washed their feet or something like that. They would have provided water for the feet to be washed. And that was because the roads were very dusty. So when they come in, they would take off their sandals and the slave would have washed their feet. Now you understand why Peter said, no, we'll never wash. God may not wash your feet. Because in his mind, um, when Jesus got out washing feet, it blew his mind. He never, he never wanted just wash his feet because in his mind, he knew it was the, the job of the slave to wash the feet of persons who come off the road. So Jesus washing his feet shows submission and humility. And Jesus is saying, this woman should not have no water. What she used are... The tears of her, the, the thing that she expressed her love with to wash his feet and she dried with her hair. He said, From I come, this woman didn't even cease to stop kissing my feet. And Simon, you don't even give me no kiss. And it was, a, it was, it was again, that was a normal in their culture. Think about like the Russians or Middle East people. When they meet, they kiss. As a matter of fact, in the Bible time, the Bible itself said, greet each other with a holy kiss. All right? Um, so in that culture, it was norm. So when somebody would come to your house, you would have, as a greeting, like today, a man would come, you shake him hand. You know? Or something like that, as a form of greeting. But Jesus went to Simon's house. He don't give no water to wash his feet. He not give no kiss. Jesus said, this woman anoint my feet with ointment. Very expensive ointment. And he did not anoint his head with oil. Know the difference. One is ointment, one is oil. Because it was normal again for when you go into somebody's house for them to use oil to anoint your head as a form of, of comfort for you. But this woman used something that was, was far more expensive than oil. She used her life's wages to get into the presence of God. I want you to realize something, brethren. That this woman showed us in principle 
what it means to get into the presence of God. And, you know, before I continue with the story about this woman, I will examine five principles that every child of God should be aware of as they endeavor to enter the presence of God. I'm going to pull from this story to see some of these principles. And when I talk about a principle, a principle is a fundamental truth that serves as the foundation for a system of belief or behavior. So God, in the Old Testament, showed us a principle, showed us a path. From scripture in general, we can see or pull from scripture some simple principles that this woman demonstrated. It showed us that this woman was, was, was hungry to be in the presence of God. It shows that this woman valued to be in the presence of God. So let us look at five, just five principles. Principle number one, whenever we go into the presence of God, what you bring into the presence of God is equally important as being in the presence of God itself. Very important. We're going, we're going to pull these back and we'll go back to the woman. So the high priest could not enter the Holy of Holies and approach the presence of God without bringing the blood. I spoke about that last week. And the incense. And if he tried to go to the presence of God, which is the Holy of Holies, without one of these, he would be dead. And you know why? Simple, he would be dead because these things have significant meaning. The blood is an awareness praise God, of the work of Jesus Christ in your life. You can't go into the presence of Almighty God unless you are aware that it is the blood of Jesus Christ that enables you to be in the presence of God. I said it from the week before that the cost of sin is so high. It separates us from God. But Jesus had created a way on the Calvary's cross. So it's all an awareness of what Jesus did at Calvary allows us to go into the presence of God. If you go into the presence of God and you're not aware that it is the blood that allows you to be alive, standing in the presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, then you will be struck dead. So the priest had to bring blood, which is an awareness of the work of Jesus Christ in his life. And he had to bring incense and this is the fragrance of prayer and praise. So in a similar way, the beautiful fragrance of prayer and praise propels one to worship. Praise God. So we see that example many times in scripture where whenever angels would go into the presence of God, they would have brought fragrances. So the Bible says in Revelation chapter 8 verse 3 to 4, And another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden incense, and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it, with the prayers of all the saints, praise God, upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And guess what happened? Because he brought what was needed to be in the presence of God, the Bible says, and the smoke of the incense which came from the prayer of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. So when we go into the presence of God, we must go into the presence of God with an awareness. That one, it is Jesus' blood that allows us to be here. And two, we must go in there with a heart of praise and worship. Another thing, principle we can learn from this woman is that getting into the presence of God is going to cost you something. It must cost you something. Amen. In Exodus chapter 30 verse 34, it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Take unto thee sweet spices, state, and anoka, and galbanum, these sweet spices with pure frankincense, of each shall there be a like weight. In other words, they are equal in terms of measurement. Now, when we look at what these things are, brethren, this is not something that is, 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 is light. All right? So if you look at the principle, you say it must cost you something. Amen. The formula was given to Moses, praise God, consists of... of, of fragrances that were very very rare and because they were very very rare it means it was very very valuable so the incense was very costly to make in this so when we get into the presence of god worship demands a price it, it demands a price of your time it, it, it demands a price of your talent 
It demands a price of your treasure. You know, some people say, but I'm not doing this. I'm going to them pay me. Or I'm not doing this. But they don't realize, brethren, that just the fact that whatever you bring to God must cost you something. Amen. And I like the fact that David, who was, when they talk about worship and Old Testament worship and, 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 and somebody who loved the presence of God, David brought up this principle in the book of 2 Samuel chapter 24 and verse 22 to 24. It says, Now Aaron said to David, Let my lord the king take and offer up whatever seems to be good to him. Look here are oxen for burnt sacrifice and threshing implements and the yokes of the oxen for wood. All these, O king Aaron, has given to the king. And Aaron said to the king, May the Lord your God accept you. Then the king said to Aaron, No, but I will surely buy it from you for a price. Nor will I offer burnt offering to the Lord my God, the which costs me nothing. So David brought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. So David was, David was sure, David was sure that he was not going to erect this threshing floor. Even though Aaron or the Jebusite was going to give him for free. He decided, look here, before I offer anything on this, before I change this place from a place where they offer wheat to a place where we're going to now offer up sacrifice to God. Amen. I am going to pay for it. In other words, whatever you do, your worship, getting into the presence of God must cost you something. I'm going to realize that this woman even innately knew that it had to cost her something to get into the presence of Almighty God. Principle number two. Principle number three is that worship comes from a contrite heart. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 30 and verse 36, And thou shalt beat some of it very small, and put of it before the testimony in the tabernacle of the congregation, where I will meet with thee. It shall be unto you most holy. So what we realize is that the incense that was going to be used in the tabernacle uh, requires preparation. And the priest had to do a couple of stuff. He had to crush the spices into a powder and then blend them together perfectly in equal portion. And the spices had to be grounded so fine and so smooth that they are not even aware of what used to be. So the old-fashioned word for crushing uh, is, is, is actually means contrition. The old-fashioned word for crushing is something, is, is practically the word contrition. So a contritor was a machine that was used to crush rocks. In other words, worship comes from a contrite heart. It comes from a heart that has been broken. It comes from a heart that realized that it, 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 the, the Bible puts it this way. It comes from a, a heart that, 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 that the Bible says are sacrifices of God or a broken spirit, the Bible says in Psalm 51, 17. A broken and a contrite heart God will not despise. For you to get into the presence of Almighty God, our worship must come from a broken, must come from a contrite heart. A heart that is not full of pride. A heart that is not full of, of being high and, and mighty, but a broken heart. So worship comes from a broken heart. To get into the presence of Almighty God, your heart must be broken. Principle number four. Worship requires intense intimacy. Hallelujah. So in the Old Testament, and you, you see the difference now between the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for worship is shaka. And it means, it means to bow down. It means to prostrate. It means to stoop. It means to do reverence or to beseech humbly. And, you know, all these words from the Old Testament were associated with an attitude of humility in the heart. But look at the New Testament word for worship. In the New Testament, the Greek word for worship is prokostinu. And prost means towards, and kino means to kiss. So the meaning of the most common word for worship in the New Testament is kissing toward. My God. So when we get into the, 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 the Old Testament, God has moved worship 
from just being bowing down, from just being prostrate, from just being uh, uh, um, to stoop down to a place where you know go to a place of kissing, intimacy. Amen. And it shows the transition even from law to grace. Because when you get into true worship, it's more than just a manual thing. It's more than just going into the presence of God and just bowing down. But it shows that you are in love with the person. You are kissing the person. What a God. So what is important, the focus of the Old Testament concept of worship is centered around bowing down and showing reference. I just said that. But the focus of the New Testament concept of worship is centered around deep intimacy and contact. My God, that's where we need to understand that worship and getting into the presence of God is not just a manual thing, but it requires some things. Worship for New Testament said it's called to get close to God. It's called to embrace God. It's called to love God. It's called to kiss God. It's called to pour out adoration to God. That's worship. And the last principle I want to tell us about worship before we jump back to this woman, because we're going to apply some of these, is that spiritual battles are accomplished when you get into the presence of God. When we magnify God through praise and worship, and you know, God dwells in the praises of his people. Amen. When we take up the, the, the sword of the word and lay down the weight of the flesh, a couple of things happen. We see that in, 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 in the case of 2 Chronicles chapter 20, we see a situation where three armies came up against Judah. And Judah in scripture speaks to worship. Judah means to praise. All right. So three hostile enemies came up against them. Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir gathered against your worship. Can I say to you, one of the things that the enemy wants to attack, the real warfare that has been from the beginning of time has always been about worship. It's always been about getting into the presence of God. I mean, that's where the war, the war started. The devil said, I will ascend above the throne of God. I will be like the Most High. He wants worship. He said to Jesus, if thou will uh, bow down and worship me, I will give you that. Because the issue, the war is against your worship. But we learn a principle that when you realize the power of your worship, praise God, then battles, true battles are really won. So Jehoshaphat called a fast and prayed for God's intervention. And God sent a word of victory by, the, by a, a person that's only named one time in scripture, Jehazel. I, you, you can search through the entire Old Testament or New Testament. I, you don't even mention his name. The man is insignificant, which brings me to another point that God can use anybody, amen, to bring a word. Anybody who spends time with God, God can bring a word through him. And Jehazel said, look here, man, you're going to win this battle. The strangest military formation was organized by Jehoshaphat at this time. And we know what happened. Look at it in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 18 to 19. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground. And all Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord, worshipping the Lord. The presence of God made a difference. That the Levites of the children of the Kohites and of the children of the Kohites stood up to praise the Lord, God of Israel, with voices and I will know what happened. God gave them the victory. Now, let us try to apply these principles that we spoke about a while ago to this woman in we read about. First of all, we realize that the same, this woman applied these principles. And this is what gave her the victory in the presence of God. Principle, when you, what you bring to God is equal as important as worship itself. What was experienced? This woman brought her alabaster flask of fragrant oil. She brought her alabaster box. She, brought, she realized that if she's going to come into the presence of God, it had to cost her something. And what it cost her was what was most valuable to her. She was already called a sinner. She was already an outcast. This was her security. This is what was going to make her not starve to death. Amen. This is what God going to keep her. This is, this, this, this is her insurance money. But guess what? Her experience is that, look here, if I'm going to come to God and I want to get into his presence, it must cost me something. 
The second thing is that worship is costly. We saw the price of the oil. Not only that she bring this aloe box of fragrance of oil, but it was expensive. It was not no cheap nothing. She never looked for the worst thing. She never looked for the, 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 the lamb that had a cast eye, as Bishop would say, it, or a broken leg. No, she brought something that was pricey and expensive. He says, worship comes from a contrite heart. This woman, with her tears, she washed Jesus' feet. And she was here to wipe his dusty feet. Amen. It, 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 shows us, it shows us that this woman, in her own way, understood the principle of what it takes to get into the presence of Almighty God. To move on, that worship is in, is, is, requires intense intimacy. So her sins which are many are forgiven. For she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. In other words, after Jesus made that statement, he looked at the woman and said, thy sins are forgiven. What am I saying, brethren? Is that she realized that even though she was an outcast, a sinner in society, it required intense intimacy. And because she had intense intimacy and she realized what God has done for her, she loved a lot. And because she loved a lot, God was able to, 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 to deal with the sin issue. All right? So intimacy, worship brings on intense intimacy. And that's what happened. She loved a lot because of where she was and where God has brought her from. But not only that she, God forgave her a sin. Spiritual battles are won when we really get into worship. Because this woman now, for the first time in her life, was free over her past sin. She would probably have been promiscuous, but she was free from that. She probably had been broken the laws of Moses, but she was free from that. It doesn't matter what other persons had to say anymore. Because the spiritual battle, the three nations that raised up against Judah, amen, came down. That Mount Seir, whatever they are, they came down because guess what? She won the victory because she knew the principle of getting into the presence of God. As I'm coming down, the story in Luke chapter 7 is an extremely powerful illustration of what it means to get into the presence of God and what it means to worship. The story of the woman... We learn that worship allows access to the presence of God. We see that because we realize that ultimately what she really did to get into the most valuable resource in this world, the active presence of God, was to worship. And then we learn a couple of things by entering into the presence of God. And, 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 and let me tell you something about the presence of God. The presence of God, worship allows us to get to a place where it will blow your mind. In a good example is found in, in Isaiah chapter 6, where the Bible talks about the seraphims. And, and this is the only place again in scripture where seraphim is mentioned. Amen. And the word seraphim actually means burning ones. I mean, some, some theologians debate over the, if the cherubims and the, seraph, the cherubims are one and the same. Amen. But it doesn't matter. But it shows us that. They were in the presence of God and they were worshipping God and they were saying holy, holy. And their voice was so loud that the Bible said that the doorposts where, 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 of, of, of where Isaiah stood and was watching this event began to shake. My God. And the Bible said when they begin to worship God, something happened. It reminded me of the event in Exodus chapter uh, 13 where the smoke came on Mount Sinai. And in Exodus chapter 19 where the, the Shekinah glory filled the place. Just because they were worshipping God. Just because they, were, they had access to the presence of God. The Bible said the smoke filled the place. What am I saying? Is that she realized that look, the only way I can get the true victory is by me getting into the presence of God Almighty God. And she did what is required. And she realized that the only access into the presence of God is not even through your thanksgiving, is not through your praise, but it's through your worship. My God. And when you get into the presence of God, there are a couple of things that happen to us. She exposed our need for the grace of God. It produces faith and it brings deliverance and peace. Firstly, it exposed our need for the grace of God in the sense that the measure of your worship relates directly to how badly you know you need the grace of God. This woman, praise God, was a nobody. But the measure of her worship shows that she really needed him. 
This woman came to Jesus knowing that even though she was a sinner, he was a grand opportunity to be in the presence of a holy God. And she did everything she knew possible to get there. The presence of God shows our need for God's grace. Jesus said to the woman, thy faith had saved thee. So apart from the fact that the presence of God uh, shows our need for God's grace, our presence of God actually produces faith. Jesus said to the woman, thy faith had saved thee. And faith by design runs synchronized with the worship spirit. When you begin to worship God, it removes the self-righteousness. Um, the, 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 you were thinking that you're, you're somebody. But faith, when you truly get into a worship spirit, it runs um, synchronized or together with a worship spirit. Faith and a worship spirit work together. He that cometh to God must what? Believe that he is. And that is a reward of them that diligently seek him. And then the presence of God brings deliverance and peace. I explore us to, to try to get into that place. Jesus said to the woman, thy faith had saved thee. The word saved thee, as it appears from the Greek word, sozo, and it actually means deliverance. In other words, your faith has given you all the benefits of God, all the goodness of God, all the blessings of God, all the prosperity of God. That's what your faith has done by getting you into the presence of God. The last thing that Jesus said to the woman is shalom, or go in peace. Shalom can mean go with God. It can mean hi. I can mean goodbye. The, 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 the word is used synonymously. But Jesus said, Shalom, peace. True worship brings us into a place of peace. It brings faith, it brings deliverance, and then finally, it leaves us in a place of peace. That's what the Bible says He will keep us in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on Him. Getting into the presence of God starts with thanksgiving. Then you graduate to praise. And then you come to the ultimate Shekinah of God through worship. And true worship is realizing that deep desire to be in the presence of God. It's our need for God's grace. And the presence of God produces faith that leads to deliverance and peace. Now one of the, one of the lessons that I want us to, to get out of this story in Luke chapter 7. And I'm closing one of the lessons I want us to get from this story is we learn that there's an attitude that we need as we get into the presence of God. There's an attitude that is very important. And we saw Jesus clearly showing the contrasting attitude between this woman who was a sinner and this Pharisee who thought that he was deserving of Jesus to be in his presence. I know one of the good examples is found in another story that Jesus told in Luke chapter 18, from verse 10 to 14. I just have two more slides, then we close. So Luke chapter 18, verse 10 to 14 says, Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. And the tax collectors were, like this woman, was known to be somebody that is a sinner in a sense. They, they, they were not liked by the people. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. He said, I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector, and a but there, as we said last week, shows a contrast in terms of how this person now is going to operate in, in, in relation to the, the Pharisee. But the tax collector stood at a distance and the Bible said he would not even look up to heaven but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves shall be exalted. The, the, the lesson that we need to learn as we close in getting into the presence of God is the contrasting attitude that each of us need to have as we get, choose to get into the presence of Almighty God. Luke chapter 7 and Luke chapter 18 shows us this attitude. 
One person thought God owed him something. And he thought that he was worthy, as it were, because of his great works. You know, you know I, 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 I teach Bible study or I, I, um, I go out and I minister. Or, or I have never done that and I will never do that and so on and so forth. And you have that type of attitude. It's about me. It's you. And we think that because of that, I am worthy to stand before God. But God rejected people like that. The other person knew God owed him nothing. But all was lacking was on him. Who needs the love and the presence of God. Brethren, the presence of God is a powerful thing. The presence of God is a powerful thing. And it's important for each and every one of us to understand, brethren, that when we get into the presence of God, God owes us nothing. We owe him everything. We are indebted to him. And even if you do some things for God, truly, nothing that we do really can pay the price of what he did on Calvary. We were bought with a price. And when we have that attitude of getting into the presence of God and understanding the value of the presence of God, you see, the presence of God is a powerful place to be. It's not somewhere that we should take lightly. That is why when they, 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 even earthly kings know this, our earthly people know this, Esther said, if I perish, I perish, I must see the king. She was the queen. But it was not customary for someone to just take up themselves and to go before a Persian king. You had to be called into his presence. But yet still, we are standing before the king of kings and the lord of lords, and we take it lightly. Don't become like the Pharisee, like Simon the Pharisee, or even this Pharisee in Luke chapter 18, who would think that God owes us anything. God don't owe us anything. You don't matter how much work you do, we are always going to be indebted to him. And if you had failed, don't let the devil hold it out in guilt. Because at the end of the day, we lack everything. He has everything. And we understand the principle. A broken and a contrite heart, he will not despise. I pray, God, that our craven will be for the presence of Almighty God. As we endeavor to get to that place, amen, where the Bible says it is fullness of joy. Haku Shabahaya. And at his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. I pray God that somebody will understand that there is a contrasting attitude being taught in all that I've said tonight about getting into the presence of Almighty God. Let us endeavor to see ourselves where we should be and realize that it's because of grace we are saved. Because of Jesus, he had bridged the gap. Because of his blood, we have access. Amen. And therefore, we are forever grateful and humbled to be or to have access to that throne of grace. I pray God that somebody was blessed tonight and that we have learned something from the Bible study. Bow your heads as I pray tonight. Great God, we thank you, Lord God, for your mercy. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your principles that you teach us in Scripture. You did not just leave us, amen, without a word. You did not just leave us without examples of how to get into your presence. We thank you, God, for what you have done and for what you are doing in our lives. We thank you, Lord, that you find it fit, amen, that while we were even sinners, while we were outcasts, while we were not worthy, amen, you saw it fit. You took the shame, hallelujah. You, 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 you took all the, the sin of this entire world, amen, and you went on Calvary's cross and you gave us an opportunity Amen. A chance to stand, praise God, into the presence of King Jesus, in the presence of our God. God, we are humbled and we are grateful. God, not anything good that we have done. We, our, all our righteousness put together, the Bible says, is as filthy rags. Amen. And if, if we try to live of our righteousness, we will never make it into your presence. But our righteousness must be of him, must be of Jesus. 
God, we thank you one more time that you see fit, that you can clothe us in your righteousness, and you can give us an opportunity one more time to be in your presence. Bless every person that is on this session tonight. Bless every person that will watch this Bible study. I pray a special blessing upon their lives as they endeavor to study your word and to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. Continue to, to bless the house of Faith Chapel. Continue, Lord Jesus, to bless Bishop Daly and his house. Uh, continue, Lord, to be with us as we look to you, who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Thank you one more time. In the mighty and the most exalted name, the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Let's have a few announcements before I close. You know, there's a sister that used to attend Faith Chapel, as in Faith Chapel, where we are. Amen. And she, she moved down to Faith Chapel, Ascot. Praise God. But she's still one of us, Faith Apostolic Ministry. Sister Sheila Burton. Amen. She passed on. But the Bible says, you know, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his seed. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So right now, our sister has passed on for those of us um, who have heard about it. And we're asking each and every one of us to pray for the family, that God will continue to strengthen them. Amen. Thank God that we serve a God who knows how to comfort us. Also, we remember this gentleman who got saved out of the tent, Brother Rohan Spence. Amen. He's from, they call him Antsman. Amen. His mother has passed and we are asking us to pray for him as well. That God will comfort him. Amen. Even in this time of bereavement. Amen. Um, one last announcement is, well, two more announcements. Um, persons who borrowed books from the church office, you know, you, you were given a loan um, of school books. We're asking you please to return them. You know, it has come to the end of the school year. And we're asking us to return those books because what we do, we pass this on to other persons who are in need. So our aim of reaching and ensuring that the whole family of God be blessed, we're asking you that if you had borrowed a book from the church, that you return it to the church office. Amen. Amen. As quickly as possible. We need them to be able to pass on to other persons who will need them coming up for the next school semester. And lastly, on Sunday, we will have one service again. Amen. So there's going to be one service this Sunday starting at 9 a.m. So it's important that we come out um, to service at 9. Um, during that service, Bishop is going to give some announcement in terms of going forward um, from that time, what we'll be doing for Sunday school, so on and so forth. But for this Sunday, it starts at 9 a.m. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, in Jesus' name.